Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, Tuesday, November 24th, 2015, right at 7 p.m. Uh, I'm Mike Avery with the Virginia Saltwater Sport Fishing Association. Uh, we just formed an association this year, a statewide association, uh, and we're trying to get the word out about the association, hoping to encourage more people to join us, because uh, our belief is that the more people in the state joins our association, the more effective we can be at representing you, the recreational saltwater angler, as we, as we try to attend the various local, uh, state, and federal fisheries uh, meetings, trying to, to represent you, the angler, at these meetings and try to uh, keep our rights going. We're also here to try to promote saltwater sport fishing throughout the state. And, and one of the events we came up with are these live YouTube uh, streaming videos. Uh, we hope this is a success. This is our first attempt at doing this, and we hope that it works okay. Uh, so please, at the end of this, give us some feedback. Did it go the way you expected? Are there things we could do to improve this? Uh, so at the end of the presentation and in the coming months, uh, please join uh, our association. Just go to our website. It's ifishva.org. Uh, and you can become an annual member for only $25. Uh, and so please sign up uh, and join us so that we can have more members to represent you, the angler, uh, at the various uh, fisheries uh, meetings. Uh, starting now and in the coming weeks, more and more of these big stripers are rolling into our bay and, and our coastal waters. So we're here uh, at Captain Max King Marine. Uh, and Captain Max is going to lead you through a presentation on how you can be more successful at targeting the trophy rockfish. And the eeling season has already begun, uh, and there's, they're, they're being caught out there today. We've got some great weather coming up even this weekend. So, uh, Captain Max, without further ado, please uh, walk us through your presentation. All right, I appreciate it, Mike. And, uh... Like I said, uh, first time doing this, so it's, we're going to learn as we go here. Uh, again, my name is Max King. I'm with Captain Max King's Marine, owner here in Virginia Beach. Uh, we're going to talk about tonight about eeling and reeling for uh, big rockfish. Uh, we've, uh, I've kind of been doing it for a little while and uh, all that good stuff. But a little bit about myself. I'm the owner of Captain Max King's Marine. We're located on Shore Drive in, Chest uh, in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, we have we sell yellowfin boats, Everglades, Sea Chaser, Bass Cat. We do a lot of brokering boats, of pre-owned boats and stuff like that. We're Yamaha and Mercury certified. Uh, we we can service any of your engine repair needs or boat needs. Um, we have a big yard here to sell boats off of and broker boats. So we do a little bit of everything in the boat business. Uh, we're located at 3829 Shore Drive. We're all over Facebook. So if you're looking for the most updated uh, fishing reports or whatever that we've been doing, Facebook, call us on Facebook and we'll make it happen for you. Uh, some common myths about Captain Max King's Marine or Cap, Cap Max, myself. I did not invent eel fishing, okay? People have been doing this for a long time. I just kind of, uh, I love doing it. Just like any, you know, somebody that hunts deer or whatever, I just love uh, targeting big rockfish using live bait. Um, I have never caught, there's a myth about me catching a 40 pound striper in the middle of Virginia Beach Boulevard. I've never caught one in the middle of Virginia Beach Boulevard in the left pole. It was a small pond next to Virginia Beach Boulevard. Um, talk about some of my accomplishments while eeling. My absolute best day ever eeling was 54 rockfish over 25 pounds, the biggest was 54 pounds, all in one day back in December 30th of 2007. And it was pitch, you couldn't see 25 feet in front of you with all the fog or whatever. So it's, that was one of my best days ever eel fishing. My largest rockfish ever caught while on a charter, uh, I had a charter that uh, caught one that was 64 and a half pounds. It was uh, January 8, 2008. It was caught off Fisherman's Island course using a live eel. Um, my personal best ever was in the ASA Nationals out of Lynn Haven in December of 2008, 61 pounds. So when you look there, 2008 was a really good year for us um, for me to have two 
60 pounders in one year. Um, yes, and I do get emails from the fish, and they're on the way. Uh, that's a picture of the 61 and a half pounder that I personally caught uh, at Lynn Haven. And my charter, Willie, caught that one 64 and a half pounds, eight ounces. Um, my weapons of choice, I'm gonna go grab a weapon and, and start talking about this. Uh, it's, this is uh, the, the uh, situation here is, uh, this is a pin conflict 6,000 reel. It holds about 240 yards of 20 pound mono. That's what I use, 20 pound mono. I got a, I got a, I, they started off at seven foot rods. Sometimes they get chopped down a few doors, you know, do it, but, but anywhere from a six and a half foot rod to a seven foot spinning reel rod. And these are legends by pin. And like I said, the, uh, the conflict reel is a new reel that came out this year, holds a lot of line. I'm very excited about using it this year and I've been a little testing with them and they, they work awesome, okay? This particular reel right here is, uh, this particular setup is what I call a free line. Doesn't have any weight on it. It has a seven off Gamagatsu octopus hook, seven off Gamagatsu octopus hook, has 20 pound fluorocarbon leader up to a barrel swivel and then just goes to the 20 pound main line. I'm not sure if you can see all that, but that's, that's what it is. 20, 20, 20, if you remember all that. Seven off octopus got Gamagatsu hook. This is what I call a free line. And um, my favorite rod about, out of all the rods that I put out in the water is just a clear free line, no, nothing else on it, no weight or bobber or anything like that. And I put out a quarter of a spool to a half a spool off the reel in hopes that an eel finds a striper's mouth, okay? The next rod I wanna talk about is what I call a down line. This down line is, uh, is it's just got a little bit of weight on it. it just, it's the same rig, everything's the same, 20 pound test, a little small three quarter ounce or an ounce inlet egg sinker that's right in front of the barrel swivel. You might have to upsize the barrel swivel just a little bit to hold that uh, weight above the leader and all that. And this is what I call a down line. How I target these fish with a down line is when I get up there and I'm fishing and I'm marking these stripers at 25 feet. Well, then I pull off 25 feet off the reel in hopes that this eel is sitting right above the stripers and hope to entice a bite. It is everybody's target that if you get out there and put a bait in front of a fish or a striper within three feet of it, he's going to eat it. A live eel three feet in front of a, uh, the average visibility for a striped bass in the Chesapeake Bay is anywhere from three to five feet. So if you can get that eel within three to five feet of that, uh, so he can see it, he's most, most of the time going to be pretty aggressive going after it. So uh, I have a free line, down line, free line, down line. I'm fishing the big center console. I use a lot of rod holders, but I'm going to show you one other rig here before we talk about how to set it up on the boat. Mike, if you can grab that other rod for me, please. Uh, sometimes in the Chesapeake Bay and you're striper fishing, the water clarity can be a little challenging sometimes. So putting a, uh, a little spinner blade in front of the hook that creates a little bit of vibration, a little bit of noise while it goes through the water while you're drifting is, uh, can be very important to get to entice a bite. I have a, in December, in the Chesapeake Bay, the striped bass is the one that's, he's a big bully in town. Nobody else is around. He takes care of business and if some kind of fuss is, is going on, he's going to get over there and be interested and come over here and check it out because he's probably thinking he can eat it. And like I said, if you get it, get that eel within three feet of that striker, most of the time he's going to take care of business. So free line, down line, all that stuff. Okay. The uh, somebody we talk about uh, the, the the bait of choice is the American eel. And everybody says, well, what size eels do you use? And I, I always tell them 14 and a quarter inches long. Every one of them that I use is 14 and a half, 14 and a quarter inches long. So you need to measure all your eels, live eels, and see how it works out for you. Right. That's a joke. Doesn't work too well here on YouTube, but 
approximately about 14 inches or so, 14 and a half inches, that's where you want your eels to be. Some of them can get really big, some of them can get really small, and big stripers, we eat all of them. So, um, the, uh, this is a typical uh, setup on, the, on, our, on our center console boat. And like I said, we're using a free line, down line, free line, down line, staggering them all the way up and down the boat. It is, uh, I'm trying to fish as many lines as possible. If I could fish 20 lines off my 30 foot boat, I want to do it. But most of the time on these average sea conditions, you're going to fish anywhere from 12 to 14 rods off my, the way I do it. I use a side rigger up here in the bow. I use tridents. I use double rod holders. I'm just, depending on sea conditions and how the eels are drifting, how much tide you got, is how many rods you can fish. Just, just imagine a big tennis spread offshore it, these are just eels and hooks, and we're just trying to you know, simulate a big school of eels coming through and trying to put as many eels in the water as possible. So this is a, this is what you normally look at and fall asleep in a bean bag looking at these rods waiting for one of them to bend over. These pin conflicts are just a standard reel. You set the drag, you click it over. There's no bait runner feature or whatever, so we just let the fish bow the rod over, take it out of the rod holder, set the hook, and then you gotta clear all those other rods, okay? The guy fighting the fish has got the easy part. The other guys on the boat are gonna clear all the rods and everything around the boat. My suggestion to you is when you finally get that first bite of the year, clear all the rods, don't let any other rod mess up that first fish of the day or first fish of the year, okay? I wanna, uh, I know we've had some bad years of striped bass fishing and stuff, but last year we've seen a significant rebound in striped bass while we're eel fishing in 2014. It's time to get excited about striped bass fishing again. I'm predicting a very banner year. Last year was pretty awesome. While a lot of us were deer hunting, duck hunting, and whatever, we were out fishing and catching fish. Um, it's not like 2006 by no means, but it was pretty darn good. Started the year off with a 37 pound fish. This is uh, this fish was caught really close to the Texaco wreck last year to start the season off. And I was pretty excited to see it. And this was late November, right about this time frame. Uh, my son, Alan, ended up with a 37 pound fish last year. Biggest rock fish he's ever caught. And he was pretty pumped up. This is during the Mid-Atlantic Rockfish Shootout. He, he loves striped bass fishing now. It kind of hooks him when he catches one over 30 pounds. Uh, this is uh, my friend Ronnie from Portsmouth. Biggest rockfish he's ever caught. 46 pounds last year as well. This is Brian Hartung. He's a friend of mine and he used to be an employee at Captain Max King's Marine in all the striped bass tournaments and everything he's put a net under a mini of striped bass and the situation was that uh last year he got an opportunity to catch one and even him mr kate man himself caught a 40 pound rockfish uh, okay um every once in a while you, you do have that problem where you get tangled up and you break a line and even the, <laughs> that face you, that ha happens when you uh, break a line, <laughs> pretty good. Another nice fish that we caught last uh, last December. Uh, another friend of mine, Sam, he, he's uh, one of the boat manufacturers that we represent. He came up and did some fishing, caught a really nice fish. This is a good friend of mine, Dr. Lane on the right there, and his friend, I mean his brother, from John from Ohio, I'm going to tell you a little bit about John. He came down the first day of fishing. We didn't do so well. We hooked one. He fought it for 20 minutes, and he lost it. We didn't catch another bite all day. Next day, we go out to the same spot, immediately hook up with a nice fish. That one was 46 pounds as well. This is Dewey Edwards. Um, we had the, uh, the G Beach Anglers Club tournament last year here, and he ended up winning it uh, with a 50-pound rockfish. He's a really good friend of mine, great angler. Last year during the Choice for Tots tournament, my son Alan with a 34 pound fish won junior angler. You see the little 
trend here, a really good year of fishing. Uh, my other son, Dr. Wang, he's 62 years old with a nice fish, 43 year old, 43 pound fish. This was another one we caught during the uh, Catching for Kids tournament. This is uh, my son's junior angler fish. Everybody who's had a mentor or somebody that you, that you fished with growing up and all that stuff, this guy's name is Warren Wright. I used to go bass fishing with him to all the local ponds down in North Carolina. And I finally caught up with him one time last year and got him to come up here and go fishing. And his very first fish in the Chesapeake Bay was a 41 and a half, 41 and a half pound fish. Pretty awesome. Especially for a guy who took me to a lot of different ponds that we wasn't supposed to go to when I was growing up. Uh, this is Ray A. I call him Uncle Ray. He's a real good friend, family friend and everything. Um, he ended up with a fish last year with us that was 43 pounds. Um, everybody's got stories about going fishing and all that stuff and why you ended up on a particular boat or whatever. This is Frank Smith. He's a good friend of mine from North Carolina. He came up here uh, all ready to go fishing on his boat, pulled into my boat dealership right when I was getting ready to go fishing. And he was getting ready to go fishing and, and he had a, and what happened was is the wheel bearing went out on his trailer. So he ended up hopping on my boat and first fish on my boat with him was right at 40 pounds. Wasn't quite 40 pounds, but right at 40 pounds. And I was very happy for him. And then all of a sudden we get another bite. We had a double. So it's a pretty good day there fishing with Frank. My uh, son Alan has a bunch of baseball buddies that are really good fishermen. And this is Nick Miltier, really good angler that, that goes fishing with my, my son Al a lot. Uh, another fort, another nice fish. That's that's Dr. Wang again. And last year we finished off the season with a really nice fish, uh, right at 41 pounds. Uh, last day of the season, 31 December. Um, every once in a while, when you get to eel fishing and you have a lot of buddies on the boat, and you kind of set your set your ground rules of where, who's going to catch what rod or what a fish what rod and all that stuff. This is the kind of look you give your buddy when he grabs the pole from you. And then sometimes you got to get, be in full contact fishing where, you know, one of your fellow anglers has a, has a crash helmet on to make sure he gets to the rod before you do. Fish a lot of striped bass tournaments and people do all kinds of things to uh, sabotage your day. And this is how, it, how my day started one day on the Mid-Atlantic Rockfish Shootout last year, sticking a banana in my, in my door. Pigzilla rules, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, last year we put on a Pigzilla tournament and we had 32 anglers show up in the tournament. And if you look at the board here, the top 10 to be in the pit, it was a month long tournament from the 1st of December to the 31st of December. To be in the top 10 of this uh, Pigzilla rockfish tournament, you had to have a 50 pounder or better. So a lot of good anglers fish in this tournament. And these are guys that went fishing when everybody said don't go fishing and it's bad out, it's no good, there's no fishing. These are the guys that go out there and go fishing and catch fish. Pretty diehard fishermen and pretty good, pretty good group of guys that we fished with during Pixola last year. Um, last year, the biggest rock fish that we caught during Pixola out of those 32 anglers was uh, with the Wayne Lambs boat. He had a 58 pound, five ounce rock fish. It was a monster. Pretty nice. Uh, Captain Max King Marine is going to play host to the Catching for Kids Rockfish Tournament uh, next year. I mean, this year, first weekend in December. Uh, we've already got the uh, Christmas tree out. So if you want to donate any toys for uh, underprivileged kids or whatever, come see us and enjoy this uh, rockfish tournament with us. Uh, everybody talks about what may have happened to you know the last few years of being bad. This right here is off of uh, Wright Brothers Memorial, January 17, 2011. It was just a murder scene for big stripers. All those stripers right there are somewhere between 25 and 40 pounds, 25 and 30 pounds, I guess. Seven miles of them, pretty crazy. Uh, everybody talks about things that may have helped or hurt us. Weather patterns doesn't 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 do a great job for what happened the last few years 
If, if you try to remember catching stripers in 2012, it was pretty difficult. But when you have Hurricane Sandy demolish the Northeast in October of 2012, you might as well write off the fishing season because that storm really messed up right where the stripers migrate quite often. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, could have caught a striper right here on Shore Drive. The water was pretty deep. Last year, we went through a major uh, weather cycle. Uh, I've never seen it as cold as it's been with ice over. This is Cape Charles Harbor, and it was really solid in February. Some of the coldest weather I've seen since I've been um, here in Hampton Roads. Like I said, the harbor was completely iced in. This is the, uh, the shanty over Cape Charles, and I'm slipped over at uh, Charlie 2, right there on Sea Dock. All right, the, the next thing we want to talk about is where to go fishing. Where do we go fishing? Everybody talks about eel fishing. Does it look pretty good there, Mike? I'd bring it a little closer. All right, a little closer. I you really want to see the secret, secret spots? Is that what we're talking about? That's exactly right. <laughs> All right, well, looking at a map of the Chesapeake Bay here, you, you see the little red mark, which is a three mile line. We have the migration pattern of the striped bass. They flow into the bay, Chesapeake Bay. Um, during the, 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 the eel areas that we talk about are anywhere from Machapungo Inlet up here in years past, all the way around Fisherman's Island, up around the concrete ships, the, the uh, plantation light, uh, and on up to buoy 42 with a cell. Um, in the last few years, fishing out here in the ocean, everybody knows it hasn't been that great. Uh, we have some really good signs of a few fish caught off of fishermen's already this year in hopes that, that we have an ocean season this year, but we'll see how that plays out. But if we talk about up along buoy 18, the concrete ships, Latimer Shoals, all those are really good spots to eel. These are really good eeling grounds. If you come down here and come out of Little Creek and you put your eel rods over, you're probably not going to catch that much. I'm not saying you won't catch one, but your probability of catching big rock fish, these are known in areas that produce rockfish eel. You know, we, uh, when you get out there and you're trying to set up to go eeling, you try to set up on uh, ledges or edges, um, look on your fish finder, look for birds, look for that kind of stuff, look for other boats, because um, a lot of times the network of friends or whatever will put you, and this day and age, everybody has a cell phone, everybody gets a phone call, everybody gets Facebook, and like I said, it, the technology is out there to where you get more dialed in to where the fish are being caught. Um, we got we got reports of uh, fish being caught today. A 38 pounder. He fished out of Cape Charles. We're not exactly sure where he caught the fish, but it was a pretty good uh, um, sign that up here on the 24th of November that we got big fish in the Chesapeake Bay already. So this uh, this map kind of shows. The primary area where my hand starts and goes all the way around and up the uh, ocean side. Uh, the Fisherman's Island down here, off of when it was really good, that's where I caught my really big fish. Last year, the primary fishing grounds were right out front of Cape Charles up here. Uh, from an area called, uh, there's a wreck up here called the Texaco, and then most of the fish were caught within five or ten miles of. Anywhere from five to six miles of that Texaco wreck up and down the bay, depending on dry, the wind, tide, and drift. Everybody says, well, Max, how do you just determine which way you're going to drift? Well, I, I fished in 15 feet of water and caught them, and I fished in 115 feet of water and caught them. But you just get out there, look for fishy areas, look for bait, look for those uh, ambush points, going up and down a slough, really, really helps, and all that stuff. When we talk about the migration of these fish into the Chesapeake Bay, everybody talks about water temperature and all that stuff. When the magic, when the bay water temperature down here, lower part of the bay gets to be about 56 degrees, and right now she's around 58, 59 degrees in the lower bay, we want that water temperature to get below 56 degrees and these big rockfish will start showing up. Magical number for them showing up is 56 degrees, magical number for them leaving is around 42, 41 degrees, okay? So having a good water temperature gauge 
helps. And when you come out here to go fishing after a major blow or whatever, and you go eel fishing, you want to be able to put your eel in the water and see it for a couple of feet. If you're out there fishing in a mud hole, you're not going to have much luck eel fishing. So you're trying to find clear water, you're trying to find the right water temperature, trying to find that stuff that makes it look fishy around, whether it's bait, whether it's gannets, whether it's uh, fish marks or some type of structure where we're going to go shallow and drift up into the deep or go deep and drift up into the shallow and just have that kind of plan of which way you're going to go. Uh, over here on the eastern shore, if it's a northeast and you're fishing inside the bay, it's really nice. If you had to come across the bay uh, in a northeast at 15, that's not so good. But once you get to this side of the bay, it's really nice and comfortable. Things that, uh, winds that you want to stay away from on the healing grounds over here on the eastern shore, if it's northwest, a strong northwest, it's going to be bumpy. So kind of keep that in mind of what wind direction you want to fish. Try to stay out of the wind. Try to stay in clear water. Um, of course, when you're out here eel, uh, eel fishing the way we do it, we turn side two. We put our lines out, the free line, down line, free line, down line, all the way up and down the side of the boat. Turn the key off. Try to be as quiet as possible because you're drifting over top of the fish before you get it to bite. Somebody getting in there, slamming a cooler down, slamming a hatch down, talking real loud. I've got a few friends that talk real loud, tell jokes all day, and it disturbs the fish. I feel like we've got to be a little bit quiet. We don't turn the radio wide open and all that stuff. We're trying to be quiet because we're drifting over the fish in order to, uh, to make it, make it uh, try to catch that fish. All right? So in a situation, the... Uh, the, 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 when we, when you get ready to go out here and, and go fishing with eels and all that stuff, some people say, well, how many eels do you need to take and all that? And, uh, what I would say to that is if you're fishing out in the ocean, um, you're going to be fishing with a lot of, uh, uh, there's a chance you might be catching a lot of dog sharks and whatnot. So I'm saying that you might need to double up on eels. If you start fishing in the bay, and you get away from those dog sharks or whatever, I'd say a couple dozen eels. But if you're fishing 20 rods, you know you need to at least have a two or three for each rod for the rest of the day, you know, that, that kind of thing. When you go eel fishing, you need to make sure you take plenty of rags and all that stuff. It's a situation where if you're grabbing eels out of a cooler, you want dry rags to grab them so you can hang on to them. And uh, when you grab an eel, and you're looking at him, you've got two eyeballs, you grab that seven off Gamagatsu hook, you go through the bottom lip and go out through his right eyeball as you look at him. If you're the eel, it's your left eye. But if you're looking at the eel, it's his right eye. And then once you hook an eel, you need to put him in the water as quickly as possible because he's kind of mad, okay? And he doesn't want to be around you anymore because you just put a hook in him. So I want you to put that eel overboard Get him away from the boat, get him out there in the striper grounds and try to catch a big striper with him. All right, so we, uh, this eel fishing, you don't catch 54 eels, I mean 54 stripers anymore, okay? You go out there, a good day is three or four nice fish, okay? When you can take your son out there, he can catch a fish of a lifetime. That's what this eel, eel fishing is all about. You're trying to catch a fish of a lifetime. You're not trying to catch you know, 15, 10 pounders, you're trying to catch five really big fish. That's what you're trying to do. Um, the average fishing day last year, we fished 25 days last year. And out of those 25 days, we caught fish 22 days. We had three days where we didn't get a skunk. We got skunked. One of those days we had a bite, but we didn't land him because it, it, we lost him with breaking off or whatever. But it's a situation where in the last few years, the situation, we don't have a storm anymore. We've done a fish cycle. We did a weather cycle. Um, we we got, had a really cold winter last year. The fishing uh, up north as they're migrating down has been phenomenal. We're looking forward to a great striper season. You're not gonna catch them if you don't get off the couch and go get out there and go fishing. Eel fishing has been the primary method for having any success with striped bass fishing the last couple years. I think it's going to be a lot more stripers around. 
We fished this past Saturday. I did get one eel bite on a, it was a small 12 pounder, but it did catch a 20 pounder on a jig. But we were uh, about middle way of the bay, uh, bay, what they call the cut channel and the ghost hole. So that was the last time I went fishing. And it's a situation where every day the fishing seems to be improving. We got reports today of that big fish, that 38 pounder being caught and weighed in. We actually saw a nice fish caught from the lower part of the bay this, you know, today. So we're just maybe another week or so from really good fishing. And we really need to be getting your boat tuned up, making sure everything's all good to go, making sure all your flares and everything, because they do, do inspections over there on Cape Charles, because the Coast Guard station's right there. So everybody needs to be well prepared, fishing license, all that stuff. It's, it looks to be um, shaping up to be one of the uh, a lot better years. Everybody that I talked to up in New Jersey, Delaware, they've had the best striper year they've had in four or five years. But they've had major weather events to kind of change things around a little bit, and I'm hoping that we get back into our normal migration where those fish will come into bay. Plenty of bait around. Uh, we, we rode back across the Chesapeake Bay from Cape Charles a day and saw breaking fish between the first island and, and, and the, uh, the Virginia Beach. And it looks looks to be uh, fishing seems to be turning on pretty good. Okay, uh, like I said, we're going to be taking questions and answers uh, via YouTube here in a few minutes. But I just like I said, think about those questions and uh, see if we got any yet. We don't if we have any yet. Oh, we got three questions. Okay, let me let me see how crazy this is going to be. All right. All right, Max. First question is from Jim Baugh, a friend. How do you best determine where to go and first set and first set out your baits, finding the right location, and what is the best technique? And how long will you stay in a location before giving up? Well, like I said, uh, I've been very patient over the years about where I've been. I've been I, you know, setting up in different spots. I, I look for a lot of fish marks on the screen. I look for something that tells me another boat caught fish there. I'm trying to look for confidence to stay there. Okay. A lot of times you have, you, you, you also, you're the captain, but you're looking at your crew, and your crew might be a little impatient about it, but you got to build confidence about where you're fishing. If you see fish marks, if you don't see anything on the screen, that's a bad thing. You call somebody, you talk to somebody, you try to communicate with somebody, you look at where people have been catching fish, and then you try to make a move. A lot of times, it, it, it turn, if you're still seeing stuff on the screen, I'm willing to make that extra time, put that extra effort in as far as being patient and not to, and not to uh, leave a spot. The worst rule number one in fishing is don't leave fish to go find fish because it, it takes a little bit of time to find them. Okay? All right, next one. Okay, next question is from Jack Bartell. His question is, do you prefer an incoming or outgoing tide and you like a slow or fast moving current? Well, what I would say to that is, is I want to, because of the, uh, the drifting that we do and motors off, I need some, something moving the boat, okay? Incoming tide, outgoing tide. Yes, you're going to establish patterns throughout the year. Max, you really need to be out there on the outgoing tide because we waylay them on the outgoing tide. Sometimes it's the incoming tide. It all depends on the type of structure that you're fishing. Sometimes uh, the Texaco wreck, let's just say um, the, because of the outgoing tide, it's big, it's, it's, it's set up on an edge there, and when the water goes across that wreck, it goes into the shallow. So if you set up in the deep water and you drift across it, it's like that bait coming to the fish that are holding on that structure of the wreck. So I'm trying to, trying to envision what happens down there with the eels in the water and where that striper is. I, I am very patient if I see fish or see fish being caught, I'll get my turn and all that stuff. But it's, uh, I just, to answer the question, I need some kind of moving tide, something moving me to make my, my drift work. Sometimes it's a little bit of wind to make it work. Sometimes it's a tide to make it work. Sometimes you have to put it in gear to make it work. But most of the time, uh, based on wind and and the tide, you usually have a little lull there sometimes, eel fishing. So you're always, sometimes you might chase the wind, you might move a little bit further off the beach to get a little bit more drift. My perfect speed, perfect speed, I look down, I like seeing 1.5. 
But if you don't see 1.5 speed over ground, 0.5 is okay as long as everything's laying okay. 0.3, I mean three miles an hour or something, that's not, that's way too fast. I want to slow down and all that stuff. But I'm not so concerned about it because if you're trolling for rockfish, your speed is probably around three miles an hour, okay? But if your speed is, if you're, if you're, if you're drifting that fast and it's three miles an hour, you might want to put a little bit more weight on. You might want to put the rods a little bit further out to allow those uh, eels to get down to the targeted depth that we're looking for. Sometimes it's just a matter of putting a little bit more line out and all that stuff. So, all right. Okay, Max, your next question is from Gene S. Do you keep your eels submerged in water before use? Okay, I buy all of my eels in bulk. I keep them in a big 55 gallon barrel drum. And before I go fishing, I take them and dump them into an icy tech cooler. The icy tech cooler doesn't have any water in them. I take the drain plug out. I leave them in a cooler with no water all day during fishing. I take our eel rag, go into the cooler, grab the dry rag, grab the eel, put them on the hook. The eels stay fine in the icy tech cooler. And every once in a while, I'll take the wash down hose and rinse them down while they're in the cooler. And that's how I keep my eels. I don't put them in a live well. I don't chase them in a live well, trying to net them and all that stuff. I'll leave them in that empty cooler with no water in them. But every once in a while, I'll rinse them down. So if you don't have that cooler, you put them in a five gallon bucket or whatever, try to, try to rinse them off, try to keep it drained off of them. They, they will drown in their own slime. So you kind of want to rinse them off, keep them active and all that stuff. So keeping eels on the boat, that's how we do it. Okay. Okay, another question from Paul Gaskill. Does the time of day matter? Time of day, well, I'm, I'm getting a little older, so I'm trying to do it all. I'm trying to do it all during the day, okay? Some of this night fishing, fishing the twilight, fishing into the evening, you can catch fish that way. I just prefer to fish during daylight hours. Um, I'm, this type of open water fishing when there's no lights or structure, you can do this type of fishing close to the high level, but it's, it's gonna be short drifts. It's gonna be a mile drift or a quarter mile drift away from the bridge or whatever at night. But most of my fishing, most of the tournaments I fish are daytime tournaments only. So I really don't try to do it at night. I just try to go out there and maximize the, the advantage of knowing when the tides are gonna be moving, knowing when the wind's gonna, you know, whether we got a little bit of wind or whatever to push us, push us and make, us, make our drift go well, okay? So trying to keep the lines in the water and trying to cover ground and go from over top of structure that might hold fish or where these fish might hold. That, that's all the questions that are that are on the chat panel so okay well like I said I, I want to go over just a few more things here let's let's take a look uh, do a, a quick overview of what we got 2015 I promise will be a better year strike bass fishing than say 2012 you need to go fishing in order to do that we've got a lot of great anglers out there trying to fit, catch these fish uh, if you log on to my Facebook page, I'll keep you updated the best I can as far as how the fishing is going, what days are going to be good days, what, what days we had good days, and what days we had bad days. And I'm, I will answer those questions about tide or whatever, what tide do we have or whatever. I, I'm feel, I feel free. I, I'm very forthcoming with information. Some people tell me stuff and they don't tell me exactly what they did or whatever, but it's pretty easy to figure out. Everybody's got technology these days, so logging on to Facebook, keeping that good fishing report, having the confidence, because in eel fishing, when you get to the fishing grounds, you gotta have confidence to leave lines in the water. And if you don't have that confidence that you're gonna catch one, it's, 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 it's a very patient game. You wait for that big rod to catch a fish of a lifetime. Whether it's for you, or whether it's for your kid, whether it's for your uncle, your childhood friend, or whatever, this is what the Chesapeake offers. And, just, and big stripers are just around the corner. Looking for a great season in December of 2015. If anybody ever has a question about how it's going or whatever, just shoot me a text or shoot me a, a message through Facebook and I'll try my best to get it answered for you, okay? I got another question for you, Max. Okay. Uh, have you given up on using bobbers? 
I'm not a, what, what, I still have bobbers on the boat. When you get out to those fishing grounds, okay, and the fishing grounds, we'll get back to that uh, boat picture in a second here. I will say that when I get to the fishing grounds and I'm having uh, trouble with the drift or whatever, sometimes putting a, uh, sometimes when I put a bobber out, it helps the situation as far as the drift and how many lines I can fish. I'll put a bobber on a, on a weighted line or something, get it away from the boat. But when you come by me out there on the fishing grounds, some boats you go out there and it's all bobbers. That's all they use is bobbers on everything. But when you come by my boat, you probably might see three or four bobbers. There's also this planer board uh, system that's been, you know, slow guys are uh, slow trolling plano boards and whatnot. You might see one or two of those out there on my spread as well. But I've caught a lot of fish on a free line with no bobber and all that stuff. And I just, that's what I just like to use. I mean, just not, not that I'm totally against putting a bobber on. I'll put a bobber on if it helps me separate some of the lines and give me more lines in the water. That kind of thing. I got some more questions rolling in here, Max. Okay, all right, good. Uh, do you ever tail hook the eel or do you go when, uh, strictly to the chin to eye hook? When I'm out there fishing, I'm going through the bottom left through the right eyeball on all of them. The problem you have if you try to do it through the tail is he's going to swim differently and it's going to mess up your whole spread. It's going to be if I got 14 rods in the water and I got one that's a tail hook, he'll wrap around everything. So it's a kind of a discipline to make sure everything's swimming in the same direction is why we go through the bottom lip. I haven't really seen the advantage of, of, of hooking somebody, something in the tail, and, well, an eel in the tail going striper fishing, but if I got hooked in the tail, I'd be more aggressive, yes, but if I get hooked in the head, I'd be pretty good, pretty aggressive as well. So we just try to, try to keep them all the same so it doesn't entangle while we're making that drift. Okay. Yeah, my thought process, process on that, that question is, you never see an eel swimming backwards, so it's an unnatural presentation. Right, but, always swim but, but like, like I said, if you put a striper can, I mean a, a Coke can in the water, and it looks like something a bait fish would eat, like a bait fish, striper's gonna eat it if it gets it within three, three feet of it. I just think, that presentation would probably work if you just present that eel to him in uh, within that three to five foot range where he can see it, but it's going to probably entangle. I just, I don't have a, you don't see an eel in natural um, presentation through the hook either. So he's going to be doing a little bit different stuff with his mouth and all that stuff. But for me, it's just being able to keep everything in order, fish as many lines as possible, get as many baits in the water to get that bite, you know. All right. Okay, question from Ashley, and she has a couple of different questions, so I'll just one at a time to you. Okay. Uh, do you cover all the different water columns? Well, I try to, but the one thing that I don't do is I don't put a real heavy weight down. Sometimes I'll do that just because somebody else caught a fish. A lot of times we're in 30 feet of water, and by putting this spread out, I feel like I got the water column covered pretty good. But if I'm out there in 100 feet of water, no, I don't have the water column clear. I am trying to uh, get out there. Most of the stripers that are feeding are up in the water column, anywhere from 20 to 25 feet. That's your targeted depth trying to get your eels down. If you drag an eel across the bottom in 20 feet of water, yes, you'll probably get a chance to get a bite, but you're also going to entangle yourself in the other predators like the dog sharks or skates or whatever. And I just don't usually do that. Um, if somebody called me and told me they got one on a down rod, four ounces or something, I might put one down. But I typically use a, the up in the water column presentation from like 25 feet up. Okay. Have you ever used or do you ever use the, the ready rigs? Ready rig bobbers are, 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 are the bobber of choice for me. I like being able to snap them on and get them out of the way of my rigs. That's the preferred bobber for me. The, the other pin bobbers, they call them, or whatever you want to call them, I, I don't usually do that because that's permanently attached to the rig. 
I just, I like having just a ready rigs. That's the one I use. Definitely recommend those because I just don't use a lot of bobbers. I might have four or five of those bobbers on board, but most of the time it's one or two of those lines. That's it. Question from Kevin T. Do the large stripers typically come farther up the bay in December, for example, Smith Point to the Windmill Point area? Okay, well, let's talk about fall migration. Let's talk about that. All right, so when we when we start talking about fall migration of striped bass, we're talking about um, coming up and down the bay, okay? How do striped bass get to Chesapeake Bay? Well, there's a C and D canal from Delaware to Chesapeake Bay, and there's a little bit of migration that pattern that happens. And up in Maryland, there's a there's a uh, there was a tournament this past weekend where there was a couple of big fish caught up in Maryland. But you're going to have big fish come through deep sea and decal that locate up on the Potomac River, and that's usually first of uh, November, uh, right around this time frame, a couple weeks before in November. We haven't seen that migration happen right at the mouth of the Potomac until we saw this a little bit, but it's been a little bit warmer winter than it has been in the past. Fall migration, they'll come down on the ocean side and hopefully make the turn into the bay or camp out here at Cape Henry. Um, last few years, we talk about those weather patterns that changed the migration a little bit in 2012 or whatever, but we feel like the conditions are set up perfectly. There's plenty of bait up here in the main part of the bay and my, the stripers will make what they call a fall, false spawn in the fall. They migrate back to the Chesapeake Bay where they spawn and everything just because there's good food source, the Menhaden. And as like I said, there's been really good amount of bait from uh, in the slew of uh, Cape Charles all the way up the bay. We saw plenty of that this past weekend. So it's everything is in place for those fish to make that turn coming to the bay. Like I said, that water temperature has got to get below 56 degrees before that happens. And they'll start migrating in the bay this week, next week. And then all of a sudden we have a, a major striper event you know, hopefully this year. Um, it, yeah, I'm just, I'm looking forward to it because I'm pretty excited about all the conditions. We don't have any major storms or anything that we gotta be too concerned about. We just have passing cold fronts. We need all those fish that's in New Jersey, Delaware to, for that water temperature to get a little bit too cold for those stripers and then for them to come this way. Okay. All right. That's all the questions. Okay, uh, like I said, I'm gonna probably, uh, Turn it back over to Mike here for a, a final little. But I appreciate everybody tuning in. I appreciate all the questions. Like I said, log on to the Facebook page. Check out Captain Max King's Marine. Check out my personal Facebook, Max King. And looking forward to seeing everybody out there on the water. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Max. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your out of your evening here to, to walk us through all that. Uh, again, please consider joining. The Virginia Sport Fishing uh, Association. Uh, we hope this was a success. We hope you were able to see the video. We can't transmit in high definition uh, just because of bandwidth problems. But please give us some feedback. Send us an email. Or give us some questions. Uh, or tell us how we can improve upon these presentations. We have a whole series planned. We're going to try to do one speaker a month. And you can go to our, our web page and see the speakers we currently have planned, if you'd like to see different speakers, please let us know, and we'll try to set that up. Uh, we just checked and we had uh, 99 viewers logged on watching this video. Uh, Max and I were just talking about that. I was thinking maybe it'd be closer to two, 300, and he was saying, nah, it ain't gonna be that many. Uh, and so Max was right, closer to 100, we got 99, uh, which I think is pretty good. This is our first time doing this. Uh, we hope to continue it. Uh, and so, again, thanks to Captain Max King for hosting us here and putting this on for us uh, and look forward to doing this again in the future. Thank you very much.